and go. Welcome to the Ortho Talk podcast. We're joined by an anonymous resident who's chosen to go by JoJo. So, welcome well, he, JoJo he, to the podcast. He or she could be a resident. We don't know. Could They're be a med student. Could be a med student. They could be a fellow. Could be an attending. Could be a leprechaun. Could be a crackhead. <laughs> <laughs> so, so JoJo's a huge fan of ours, just like everyone in the world is, and asked if uh, if he or she could participate uh, and talk about what's going on. So welcome, JoJo. Thanks for having me. All right. So JoJo, you're somewhere along the path of uh, becoming an orthopedic surgeon, or maybe you already are. What kind of factors go into deciding a, a specialty for you? Yeah, that's a good question and one that continues to evolve. I think on the plus side, I've liked almost every subspecialty within orthopedics, which has made uh, the process really fun in terms of deciding within the subspecialty fields. Something that drew me to orthopedics to begin with was how, in a lot of ways, it's one of the most general surgical fields left in the sense that you can operate from a macro to a micro level from huge joint arthroplasty to more uh, of microsurgical techniques. And you can operate on children to professional athletes to adults. And uh, I still am really interested in that versatility within orthopedics. So some of the fields within orthopedics I'm most attracted to kind of maintain that element of versatility. So foot and ankle, pediatrics, hand, that allow you to do so many different types of surgeries and in a lot of ways treat lots of different types of patients as well. Uh, so I've slowly started to narrow down the field. What's your favorite bone? Mm, maybe the navicular. Ooh, that's a cool bone. Why Jay, how do you, yeah, that's a, that's a first. Is it? Yeah, everyone yeah. everyone has said uh, scapula or coracoid so far, except for Jay. coracoid just yeah. because it's the lighthouse. Yep, yep, that was exactly. Yeah, it. our our old shoulder attending, he's like, oh, it's this, it's how you know you're safe. We'll stay lateral to the coracoid, so he he's obsessed with it. We had him on last week. Shout out to Dr. Summerson. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, my my favorite bone was the fourth toe middle phalanx. So why the navicular fourth freak? toe middle phalanx, why? Yeah. Well, I think the first toe becomes problematic because you get hallux rigidus and it's painful and just gets in the way. The second toe is always too long, so you have to always shorten that. <laughs> you know, the fifth toe, you get bunionettes. Um, the third toe is like the middle finger. It's just kind of mean and unruly. The fourth toe never really seems to give people trouble, so I, I like the fourth toe. The middle phalanx kind of hides in there. In the middle of it and doesn't really cause problems so it's a it's a small bone it's pretty cute and it's my favorite so why the navicular though oh i just like that a lot of people will pimp you on how it's like a small boat or resembles that <laughs> and then you can also have the navicular of the wrist the scapoid which is a peanut which i also think is just funny and cute <laughs> well, those are those are good reasons actually that's cool i do yeah, like the navicular. um I like the talus, a good talus. Yeah, what do you think about the talus? <laughs> like this one sitting behind me? I don't me. like the talus. No one likes the talus except Jay. <laughs> <laughs> look at that. Look at that. Dude, the talus is a beautiful. But you look at that talus and it's like pristine cartilage, and then you bugger it up and fuse it or replace <laughs> it with metal. But anyway, you know, um, we, that's awesome. We had one, we had one resident, one co resident in residency that had three like talus extrusions when he was on call. Like three total. That's Who's a bad that? day. Bob, Bob had uh, three, three <laughs> talus. Yeah, Rob, he Rob knows he he knows about the podcast, but yeah, three talus extrusions like throughout his residency. Crazy. He uh, he ended up going into shoulder elbow, so I don't think that. So he doesn't like the talus either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, Joe. You know, I, I know that you're somewhere along the path of residency, but you've progressed past your first year or two. You know, what's it, do you feel, what's it like kind of moving past that, that period of time? Like, does it feel better? Because literally a few days ago, everyone's moved up a step, right? July 1st. Right. So how does it feel to keep progressing? 
there's definitely an element of imposter syndrome with every at the start of every new year where there's more responsibility, more eyes looking at you for the answer or what to do, um, which becomes an, an interesting situation when in so many ways you still feel like you don't know the answer and you still have so much to learn. Um, but I think what I have learned over the course of previous training years is, well, how do I find the answer? Even if I don't know it, at least I know where to go looking now um, or what the immediate next step should likely be in having um, established relationships with a lot of the faculty to ask them for help and when is it okay to call them and uh, more senior residents or just developing relationships within the field with other co-residents and asking them or other senior residents for help even if they aren't on call. Uh, I think everyone who goes into orthopedics loves the the dynamic and element of teamwork that's kind of required and no one's upset if you call them with the question if they're not on call uh, to kind of strategize patient care or anything that's going on which always makes it more fun but it's certainly nerve-wracking yeah that's a that's a good point that you brought up because we, we've had this conversation i think with mikey before about like when to call and when to kind of try to deal with it on your own how have you like how has that evolved for you how do you define that now um like 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 honestly i when i started fifth year i would get annoyed at some of the calls i would get about like diabetic foot ulcers I'm like why are you calling me about this this is dumb um yeah. but yeah it's, it's a hard line and i guess it's it's different for everybody what's it like for you Going both going both ways, like whether when you when you have learned to call for help, like how do you yeah. set that moment, or whether you want someone to call you for help. Um, I feel like some of the best attendings uh, in residents who I've worked with have established um, that they're approachable. They know everyone by name, and when they're the OR, they make a point of calling everyone who's working in the OR by name rather than you grab me this or you hold this here and really pay attention during the timeout. Um, and I think there was an attend a, a pediatric attending, I think his name is Dr. Skaggs, who presented some literature about how patient outcomes are much better if you set a tone of accessibility in the OR. People are more likely to speak up if they observe you doing something incorrectly or identify an error sooner rather than later. Um, so I've tried to kind of, as hard as it is sometimes at like three o'clock in the morning to get that call about, oh, how much time, is it okay to give this patient Tylenol? And you're like, that's an over-the-counter medication. Uh, trying to remind myself that ultimately, if you set the tone of I'm an accessible person, both as a senior resident or as an attending in the future, hopefully that will lead to better patient care and like a team dynamic. So yeah. it, it's hard, but I just keep trying to remind myself, like, that's the type of attending I want to be, where my, my residents will call me in the middle of the night if they're concerned about a post-op patient rather than not calling me until the next day when it's irreversible. Yeah, it's a fine balance, because you don't, you don't yeah. want to miss that phone call that's going to hurt someone. I right, but a, you also have to great. learn how to give your junior autonomy and right. push them to make their own decisions, because at a certain point... You know, everyone kind of, you have to get rid of that hand-holding. Yep. Uh, so one thing I like to do is turn to them and take that extra minute or two and say, like, well, what's your plan? What do you think is appropriate? What would you like to do? And a lot of the time, like the Tylenol thing, it doesn't, it really doesn't matter. Um, and so forcing juniors to kind of make that decision uh, of, well, do you think this needs another stitch? I up to you. What do you think? Yeah, put the decision on him. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Sweat yeah. Make that, and that way, when there's something goes wrong, you can say it wasn't my decision. I like it. <laughs> um, but no, I think I think that was a great point about the name thing because I, I've always been terrible with names and oh, I'm awful. I, I, gosh, like I, I'll talk to you for an hour and then. I won't remember your name and I'll call you like Joe or something. But like, <laughs> but like I, there's this resident, there's this attending um, in Texas, uh, Dr. Hagedorn, who 
he's he's really really good with names and he he came into our program when i was at pgy four i think or three i think i was pgy three he came into our program right off the bat he just four. knew every name no because we rotated with him as fours but oh, i did yeah, yeah, right, 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 three, yeah. three um and we're old yeah i know right that was like oh, gosh but anyway like so within weeks he just knew all the staff you know the janitors anyone walking around the hall I asked him one day too. I was like, "How do you, how, how are you so good with names?" And he told me he made it a point. Like it's it's something you can work on, just like a skill. Uh, he wasn't always good with names, but he really thinks it's important to, to make people feel included. So he would repeat names to himself when people weren't looking. He would look at their badge to remind himself of their names. Yeah. And uh, make mental notes. And he he really prioritized it, and people really responded to that. So. So I try to do the same. I would say I'm still like a three out of 10 um, at names, but it's a work in progress. So. Yeah, I totally agree. It's, it can be really hard to like people that you've been working with forever that you never caught their name at the beginning. And now you feel like you're too far into the game to ask them yeah. what their name is. And it's yeah, a little awkward. uncomfortable. But uh, I think yeah. I try to make a point as much as possible to like, really get to welcome and the interns and juniors and make them not feel belittled, but they're part of a team uh, and help them with that transition too. Cause I think that's the hardest when you go from medical student to intern in today's like medical society, when medical students just shadow, I mean, 20, 30 years ago, our attendings were actually implementing medical care as medical students. And now whether it's just the culture of medicine or the lawsuits, it's really dramatically changed where we get less and less autonomy through the training years, which makes it really tough as you try to make decisions on your own. That's a good point. Um, what, what do you think, just a little bit related, I guess. So I'm gonna be an attending in a month and I was thinking about this and a lot of my residents uh, from when I was in residency, my junior residents, they're going to be my, my residents again, except I'll be the attending now. And obviously, I'm not going to make them call me. You call me Dr. Chen now, thank you very much. Or well, some, some people did that. You know, like, what? That's such I, a hard, I, we have this, yeah, it's the same thing here. Like, fellows who stay on, who you've been calling them by their first name the whole year, or similarly, uh, your co-resident who leaves her fellowship and then comes back as an attending. Um, and I, I, I've talked to some of my co-fellows about it. And I used to actually call them by their first name because that's what I always called them as of a year ago. Um, yeah. But after talking to some of my co-residents, they're like, oh, I don't know. I just call them doctor now and use their last name. More of a sign of respect. And you know, uh, so I've kind of, switch to now calling yeah, calling yeah. my doctor yeah two, two i'm gonna things. make them call me supreme master all <laughs> <laughs> my old residents call me that so so remember uh what we had one remember spec came back as an attendee he did that we need to get fred on here um but he was he was a long time right, he, made call him, he made us call him doctor yeah. well he he kind of prefaced it he made us call him doctor spec around other people but if we were just like talking, we could have called him Fred. Like that's too complicated. I, I think yeah, I just it, it gets a little. It gets a little uh, yeah. tricky. The other thing, isn't it funny how you're not really a doctor, doctor until you're an attending? Yes. Isn't that isn't that weird? Right. Like yeah. <laughs> we're all doctors, but we're not really doctors until you actually have that responsibility. I come yeah. from a family of physicians, and even though technically I've graduated medical school. No one in my family believes I'm a doctor until I'm an attending. Yeah. yeah <laughs> They're no, like, I, oh, you don't really know. <laughs> it's funny. When I was an intern, one of my, oh, this is, I, I'm not afraid to say this is one of like the dumbest things I've done, but I got in, I got in a big fight with like this, uh, Jay, I, you might know this story. I got oh, in a yeah, big well, fight uh, with this, yeah. uh, uh, I think it was a circulator yeah. at the time. Um, but I pulled the doctor card on her and, uh, she was just pissing me off because I was like, it was a vascular case. I was holding the leg. I prepped the whole thing with one arm. I draped the whole thing with one arm. She got mad at me because I was throwing the stickers on the floor. And I'm like, what do you want me to do? It, long story short, it escalated. I pulled the doctor card and I still regret it to this day. I apologize to her. Uh, 
obviously, because I'm. <laughs> that, was, that was like the one time I lost my. Shit. I don't. I don't think that ever worked. It never works. It never works because nobody. <laughs> nobody cares. Yeah, nobody cares. Yeah. Yeah. No. It's, nobody really cares at all until like you actually get paid the money. But I still don't think they care. You just get like written up more. And yeah. More. Now you get written up. Like, oh, you're a doctor. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna write you up for being every second late to the oh, yeah. room. It, and, it's way easier to get written up. Yeah, I, have a, uh, I have so many mixed feelings about the whole writing up system because I also feel on the flip side, any healthcare worker also on a daily basis has lots of like near misses or framing it more in a positive oh, yeah, yeah. way, like a good catch. And why aren't those ever rewarded? We have like such a strong system of reprimanding people and this like tattletaling in a lot yep. of ways rather than just like calling up the resident and saying, Oh, you put in for the wrong, like, uh, limb in terms of weight bearing restrictions. Do you mind changing it? Instead, that's an SRS. Or yeah. what if we just call, like call the resident and then what if the resident just like put in a good catch rather than someone oh, wow. else? Like you're in trouble. Like why is it like, always cool. the yeah. That, that's a great idea. I, man, that's awesome. Because the culture of medicine is so, we've gotten used to it being in the culture, but it's actually quite negative at times. And this is a, a nice way to turn that frown upside down. So I like yeah, it. Yeah, it just creates um, so much animosity between the different healthcare providers rather than like rem like reminding everyone we're on the same side. We're all here taking care of the patient. Mistakes happen, unfortunately, despite our best efforts. And yet, you really make the resident or healthcare worker who, uh, for that error, makes them feel so bad about it, rather than just like kind of congratulating the person who picked up on the mistake. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. there are situations in which we do need uh, like writing up or like egregious events that happen, but I think there could be a healthier balance. Have you guys ever been written up? Yes. I have to. Jay, Jay, I don't think you have. You're, I'm, I'm you're pretty, too nice. I'm pretty clear. What, you're what, too nice. Uh, I think, I think uh, I was so, close a few weeks ago. But I I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you two, two stories of getting written up. Not, not, both of them aren't me. One was a co-resident. Jay, I, uh, you might remember this one. But did I write you up? No, no, you did not write me up. <laughs> but I've written you up before. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we had a co-resident who got a diabetic foot, another diabetic foot. These, these things like never turn out positive right um but he had a diabetic foot consult on the floor uh he goes up there he debrides the the foot um the guy, the guy can't feel anything obviously because it's a diabetic foot so he doesn't use any pain medicine and the nurse writes him up because he did it without giving him any pain medicine and it like it became like a decent decent sized deal but um, you know he he was fine the other one this is me and this was like a few months ago i got written up because all right, I gotta give a little backstory. So I was in conference, right? And then I had, I got asked to come start a case, uh, you know, leave conference early, go start a case. So I do that. I go over to the surgery center, I get everything ready and I end up sitting around for like an hour. So I go over to the pre-op area. I'm like, guys, what's going on? Like, why aren't we rolling? Like I've been sitting around, let's get this going. Um, and she's like, well, they're just blocking the patient. I'm like, what do you mean they're just blocking the patient? Like we've been here for an hour. They could have been doing this before. Uh, she's like, well, they're just going. I'm like, okay, fine, whatever. So then I walk, I walk around and leave. Turns out I get written up for my tone. I didn't say anything like bad. I didn't curse anyone out. I just got written up for my tone. <laughs> so I had to go apologize, and I did. You, you do have a, you do have a bad condescending tone I, all the time. I do, it, but I but, can actually. I, I really can though. Like when things aren't going, I don't really get mad or raise my voice. I just get really condescending. But in all honesty, it probably doesn't help you that you're like six foot five or whatever, however tall you yeah. are. And you like a lot. And, yeah, but you know. I mean, I'm not the only tall ortho guy. That's true. But maybe I am the only tall ortho yeah, guy with a condescending so. voice. But anyway, yeah. that was the one. That, I think that's the one time I've gotten written up. But I have written up a lot of other people, just like because I, I think the system is dumb. So like, in, like a lot of attendings do this too, where they'll just. Like, if something goes wrong in the OR, I'll just, like, write it up. PSS. Put it in the computer. Or like, if anything goes wrong, like you just, you, you make the system a mockery because the system is a mockery. So, I don't know. It's probably so, not you, the right thing you, to do. you do it to turn it into an yeah. even more mockery. Yeah, I, I do it just to highlight how stupid the whole system is. 
<laughs> Has any change ever been made? No, <laughs> never. <laughs> Nothing's ever come of it. Yeah. And I, I, I don't. Go ahead. Well, I was going to ask Joe what Joe's been written up for. <laughs> oh, a PT. The example I gave, um, my PT order and another resident put in for the OT order were different. See, correct limb on both sides, but one person had put in uh, posterior hip precautions and the other one didn't. Oh, they mm. wouldn't go for that? Yes. Well, that's awful. <laughs> Which, that's, way, awful. that's way worse than mine. <laughs> <laughs> Which, I, it again, goes back to my whole point of like, well, no one never paged either of us to inform us, to clarify one way or the other, like that could have been an easy fix in the hospital. And instead, you're left feeling kind of frustrated with whoever uh, put in that uh, complaint because it just shows kind of the nature of medicine that it, it probably took more effort to submit the write-up than it did just to page or call us. Oh, yeah, but for sure. You're for, for submitting write-ups. Yeah, my, attending, um, my attending yesterday... He was telling me the story about how he was he had done the surgery and forgotten to do a timeout. <laughs> Just <laughs> and started he started operating. And then he noticed, you know, you get this feeling in the back of your mind that something's not right. And then everyone's quiet. So he stops and he looks around and like the staff and the nurses, they're like huddled in the corner, like whispering. <laughs> and he's like, What's going on, guys? What what's the deal? And they're like, you forgot to time out. He said, well, what? You, you just weren't going to tell me? Like, you're, gonna, like, <laughs> you're just going to like wait till I finish the case and write me up? Like, just, all right, let's just do the time out and go. It's exactly the point. It's just just like, it doesn't need to be, oh, I'm going to get him. Let's, let's, let's right. get him. Yeah. You know, let's, let's do something positive. Well, that, so that's, yeah. happened, that's we're happened before, we're too. We're supposed to be on the same team here. We're all trying to take care of the patient um, yeah. and protect the patient, ultimately make the system better. And yet so many of these policies really don't lead to any change. And instead, it just creates a lot of bad will between different providers. So, yeah, I think the whole thing is brought on by power dynamics and then it just perpetuates the same power dynamics. Right. That's, that's a whole problem. Yeah. I, I heard this uh, rumor. I don't know. I don't know if this is true or not because I never really looked into it. But I heard this rumor that um, at my institution, you can get like, paid to write people up or something and you know i don't know how true that is or not and maybe i should ask somebody else in my institution who might know but the idea is just kind of kind of silly just promoting um promoting writing people up but it's like covid you know. right <laughs> like the covid hotlines yeah you, you, you get you get paid to, I, don't, I, I think some places will like reward you for like snitching on people if it comes up to something like crime oh. what you but for COVID. What do you snitch? Like, if they cough, you snitch them? Or no, if they're, like, walking around without a mask, or if, they're, like, they're in the park having a party, you know, stuff like that. Well, shoot, why don't we just do that? Why don't I just write each other up and get <laughs> like, you know? Because then we're going to go to the jail for not wearing our mask and having park parties. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have money to bail each other out. So. That's true. That's true. And then we'll end up net zero, and we'll just have wasted a bunch of time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> We we know an yeah. attending that finished a case before doing a timeout. At Oxnard? Or no, at, we. At uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> where, somewhere. Where that? Somewhere. How do you have yeah. Any stories I don't know about. <laughs> like, I'm, I can't say where because I don't want to get him in trouble because I like him. But okay. they yeah. uh, they they finished the timeout and he was done suturing. <laughs> Whoops. Oh oh. You oh, know what I'm talking oh, about? Oh yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> Oh, well, this is a, so. This is so common that I, that I didn't even. It just didn't cross my mind. Yeah, this is like the the norm for the, yeah. <laughs> like what's what's the what's taking so long to time out? The case is already done. Yeah. <laughs> it was a, it was a little toast. I know, I know. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> I could do the accent too. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> Don't get him in trouble. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, um, well, Joe. You're, I'm, I don't know if I'm giving too much away here, but I think it's safe to say that there's a good chance you're a female in, in orthopedics. And that's not to 
not to not to, not as common. In fact, of all the specialties, it's one of the one of the specialties with the least amount of females percentage wise. It may be number one. I'm not exactly sure, uh, but it's something that you know. Have you when you were looking into specialties, did that ever discourage you in any way? Just looking at orthopedics. Obviously, you wanted to do orthopedics, but just thinking about maybe the culture or the or the number of females, or you know, did you ever have any reservations about that? No, not really. Um, I grew up in a pretty male dominant, like larger family. So I was never really turned away by that. Um, in my home medical school institution and all my mentors, because orthopedics is such a male dominant field happened to be men. And they were all so encouraging and really went out of their way to make sure that I didn't not pick orthopedics because of that. Um, so I felt like they were actually compensating to make sure I felt comfortable in making points that you can do everything I can do. Uh, sometimes it'll just take a little bit more of finesse in terms of positioning yourself and make sure you ask for the table up or down so that, you know, I'm 6'2 and you're 5'4. And so when I ask you to do something and you're, you can't do it, it's, if the table's in the wrong position, just ask them to move it. And so kind of be assertive and making sure that you're well positioned physically to be able to do some of the more challenging parts of cases. Um, and then from a mentorship perspective, I got really lucky in having a lot of great mentors who were really encouraging and definitely went out of their way to make sure that I felt welcomed. I think that's, that's great. It sounds like you've had some really good influences in your life that have you know, kind of negated some of the possible negative uh, stigmas out there for you. So that's that's awesome. And there's some definite advantages to being uh, shorter because I bump my head on the stupid like white handle <laughs> every time. Five times a day, like <laughs> and yeah, Mo, he breaks all the stitches that he yeah. ties, and there's there's all kinds of. I had, sometimes gosh, I don't normal. touch the ground when I sit on a stool, <laughs> which can be a little frustrating because then you're like awkward <laughs> trying to push yourself towards the table. Yeah. <laughs> like using your butt to kind of move the stool because your feet don't touch but <laughs> other than How that you call for a step stool if you're operating with the with oh the very often <laughs> after like the first case if once i get a sense of where the t table height will be with an attending as i'm like positioning the patient i'll just go ahead and grab the step stool and like put it where i'm gonna stand nice. I had, my heights worked against me. Like I, one time when I was a junior, I wasn't allowed to reduce a hip in the OR because my attending wouldn't let me get on the table because he didn't think he could catch me if I fell off. <laughs> so he wouldn't. He wouldn't let me do it. He let someone else do it. I think he let me do it. Oh, were you there? Were you the other one? Well, I, I think that's happened to us before. Yeah, like, that, that, that's I it. I remember attending me like, uh, Mo, I don't want you on this table. Like, yeah. I I, want I, Jake on this table. Yep, yep, that's the one. Was that, was that us? That's, that was us. <laughs> <laughs> I remember doing that, thinking it was ridiculous. But Yeah, I'm but, like, what do you mean? I'm not going to fall off this thing. <laughs> but Yeah, I don't know. I'm not short. I'm like, but anyway, that was, that was funny. <laughs> I think so, with taking yeah. programs, too, was a really interesting process for me because – I knew I wanted to, uh, I was interested in some of the academic programs because just looking on their websites, they tend to be much more 50-50 in terms of male to women. Uh, but then when it ultimately came to picking my program, uh, I realized that like the number of women advertised has nothing to do with the culture of the program. Mm -hmm. And just because there's a larger percentage of the faculty and residents who are women doesn't necessarily mean that program or that culture is a good fit for you. Hmm. Um, and so I ended up at a residency that definitely is not close to 50, 50, uh, in terms of male to female residents. And yet I couldn't feel like more comfortable in our team room and with my co-residents. And I feel like the juniors respect me just as much as my male counterparts. And so it, it really just ends up, being where you feel like you fit in the best. Why, why do you think that is? Ended up not being so much based off of like the net number of women to men. Why do you think that is? Why do you think like higher proportion of women in programs doesn't necessarily correlate to the culture? 
I don't know if it was so much if I could generalize it to that level or more of the culture of those specific residency programs. I just hmm. weren't as close to it as some of the other programs I ended up liking more. Because our program had a good amount of women, but I wouldn't, <clears throat> I wouldn't call us a close knit program. I, I guess yeah. kind of like what you're saying that. Um, yeah. I don't know. That's that's interesting. I never never really thought about that. Yeah, I think the culture could have definitely been improved um, in many aspects. But what what about what about your program, Joe? That what are there specific things they've done to to make female residents feel welcome or is it just organic and just developed that way do you think i really think it is just organic and the idea of treating everyone the same um and keeping the same expectations for everyone and setting the bar at a certain level of like integrity humility and being a team player and those are qualities that regardless of anything about you you can meet and so if everyone kind of buys into trying to be the best resident and team player and provider i think you just ultimately end up with a really great culture of people who are excited to come to work and work hard yeah that's yeah the the program i'm at and then the program i i was at it's really interesting i there's, I, mean, I, I think I've definitely noticed a difference in, you know, the, the whole culture and how supportive they are of not, not just women, but just, you know, camaraderie in general and, and working together. And it's, it's, it's interesting how, you know, we do a lot of things to try to force it, but like you said, it's a lot of it has to be just be organic and I think getting the right people in place who, who are willing to work hard and, and do that. So. You know, if, Jay, what, let, me, let me know what you think about this. I, so I'm trying to think, I've, I was thinking about that statement and like why, because we, we've had a, like a decent number of female residents throughout the history of UTMB, right? I'm trying to think why it's, it, and I, I wouldn't call UTMB, uh, I want to be careful with my words here. I, I wouldn't call it cohesive, I guess is, is a fair way to put it in regards to female and male residents. I'm trying to think why. And I think I think a lot of it has to do with recency bias. And um, I, I think like, you know, we, we've had good female residents and we've had not so good female residents. And I think the not so good female residents would kind of stay in the memory of people. And that kind of leads to this, you need to show me that you're gonna be good. Um, like you, you have another hurdle to jump, I guess. Yeah. You, the hurdle is set by the people before you. And I was thinking about that too recently. I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of, so let's say you have two residents, a male and a female, and we've, we've had these situations and we've had, you know, male residents who they tend to avoid the OR. They tend to not, not go above and beyond and just barely meet the minimal criteria. And a lot of times in our heads, we kind of cut them, you know, we cut them slack. We're like, Oh, they're just uh, whatever good dudes, I guess, or whatever word you want to use. Good dudes. Great guys. Good, yeah, they're just being good dudes. And then at the same time, if I think if a female resident were to do the same, you know, unfortunately, sometimes there's more more of a bullseye on certain people because of their background or demographic. And say, like, oh, is so-and-so, you know, avoiding the OR because, you know, they're like, you know, they're scared or they don't want to participate or they don't want to work hard. And I think it's a lot of it's on us to kind of, you know, we have these biases. Uh, part part of this recency bias, like you said, maybe from people who weren't as, as good before. But at the part same of, time, you think part of it's good dude bias. Good dude bias. Did we just turn? Did you just make a new phrase? I like that. The good, the good dude, dude yeah. bias. <laughs> yeah. Oh, by the way, we're gonna, we're gonna sell some t-shirts and be on the lookout um, for the good dude t-shirt. But um, I do think a lot of it's bias on the on the part of our of ourselves and we should do a better job of, of looking at everyone equally and um I, I don't think it's good if you're a male female uh if you're neither and no matter what color you are you should expect to to work hard and be a team player and we should hold everyone to those standards if they're a good dude or not or even if they are a good dude so anyway that's my thought yeah our our, our, our program was weird like our class was very tight-knit 
Like probably yeah. probably the most tight knit that we've had, as at least the it's classes crazy. that we've seen come through. Um, yeah, some of the other ones are fairly close, but I mean, I wouldn't. I don't know. It's a it's a weird program. I don't know. I don't know how to put well, none it. Of, none of us. I think all of us. Well, you know, we we all take pride in in what we do, and we all try not to dump on each other, and just take care of our own business. And that's really helped us a lot. We're not none of us are uber competitive. To where yeah. we're like, oh yeah, we gotta be, you know, like literally all of us, all of us try to stay in the middle of the pack. You know, we're just semi, we're, we're semi good like, dudes. We're average dudes. Uh, <laughs> we're like, we're just, we're just dudes. <laughs> and dudes yeah. can be girls too, by the way. This is not, yeah. this is not dudes just a be girls. Thing. <laughs> dudes can dudes be dudes. Gender neutral. Yeah, dudes is gender neutral. Exactly. Dude is gender neutral, but um, yeah, it's interesting. And I think, I, you know, the culture is changing for the better. And that's one of the things I'm excited about going back there and, and trying to be a part of that change. So if anyone's listening, check out UTMB. I'll be there. I'm a good dude. And uh, I'll pay you to be a good dude as well. This is my promotion. <laughs> right. So, so Joe, I want to move on to this other topic that we've talked about outside of the pod. And, you know, when, uh, when you said you were a huge fan of the pod, and uh, you wanted to kind of come on and, and give your two cents. And, you know, we found, I found out that, that you were pregnant in residency too. And that's, that's not very, that's not very common at all. And it's something that it's not something that most guys ever have to think about, you know, how do you carve that time out of your schedule and what your program think? So I'll tell you what kind of happened and, with me, I had I had a kid during residency, and a lot of a lot of guys do become fathers during residency. And everyone in our program basically took a week off, and it came out of I think vacation time, um, or or was it? Yeah, I think it came out of vacation time. And you didn't have paternity. No, it came out of our own time. Hmm. You know, like they they can say you do, but it didn't. All I know is like I had to log it as as actual time I was missing oh, or something. That's weird. Um, but I mean, that's that's the culture anyway. I think at a lot of places too, like the guys get a week off, and um, I don't know. What what are your thoughts? How are you managing it? How much time are you getting off and and stuff like that? Yeah, it was a really hard decision, um, and I still don't know what the right answer is, and I don't know if there even is a right answer. Um, I think as I come closer and closer towards the end of training, it makes you only realize how much you still don't know and how every like operative opportunity is so precious and like running down to like write down every note after every case so that if you're ever on call, uh, you can refer back to those notes or a similar situation in the future. And so the idea of a prolonged period of time where you're missing out on um, those opportunities is really terrifying. And, you know, to someone who isn't in the field, they would say, that's crazy. You do five years of residency and a one year fellowship. You're worried about taking a few weeks off. Like, why is that a big deal? But you do realize how important every day is to kind of continue to learn and be involved. That being said, there, there is, uh, if you want to have a family, it is just, biologically easier if you do it when you're younger and there is no good time uh whether you're a resident a fellow or a junior faculty member in board collection and trying to build your practice uh there when i was thinking about it like it only gets harder yeah. your responsibility every single year only goes up and up and up um and like being a fellow I mean, a lot of fellows don't even take vac a day of vacation, no less a week, because they're so worried about every single day and how much you're learning. Um, and the idea of like trying to start a practice and then taking time off, that's also kind of imaginable. Like, how are you going to balance that? Um, so I ultimately decided that there was <laughs> honestly no good time, but I did want a family and just to kind of bite the bullet and see how it goes. I uh, waited until I was a more senior resident um, for call schedule reasons, hoping it would, wouldn't be as onerous on my co-residents and trying to make the call schedules then. And 
um, not missing like a critical rotation that would kind of persuade me to one subspecialty over another. Um, but it's, it's really hard to know, like, am I hurting my training? But at the same time, I think uh, there's, there's been a lot of research that has shown like women make better physicians than men. And I don't know if having children is part of it. I don't think the article went into that, like what proportion of women were mothers specifically, but I do think it makes you more relatable to certain patients. Uh, you learn how to take care of someone else. Um, but it's, it's a little nerve wracking because there is a lot of literature out there that shows that as men go from single to dating, to marry to kids, their burnout levels within medicine dramatically go down. Hmm. And the exact opposite is true of women because as you go from dating to married, you've in a sense inherited a child because social norms are such that the women, the women in relationships end up taking care of the men more often, even in kind of 50, 50 relationships, they're just these kind of more traditional norms that end up coming about despite everyone's best efforts. And that stress is only amplified once you have kids. Um, so I love working. I can't imagine not going back to work afterwards. Uh, I think I'd be a horrible stay at home mom. I'd go crazy. I have a huge sense of purpose and pride by going to work. I love taking care of patients and I can't imagine anything changing that. My mom um, worked throughout my childhood, only retired recently. And I always, when I was little, it was really heartbreaking. She could never make it to any of my games, matches, school plays, what have you. But I think as I entered high school and college, I had such a great sense of pride seeing her work and contribute to society that that really pushed me into orthopedics and kind of pursuing my dreams to the highest level, not being persuaded otherwise just because of my gender. Wow, so many great, uh, great points there. That's, that was great. Like, my mom was a, she worked, she still works as well. And um, I think it's just, you know, nothing against anyone who decided to stay at home or anything like that. No, but not at all. I, I think that's think, a very yeah. personal decision. I just think, right. for me personally, I would not be very good at it. Uh, yeah. I, I just yeah. don't think mentally I'd be very happy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what kinds of things, you know, so, gosh, there was, there was a lot of good information there that you said. So I guess, I guess it's, it's really important then for, for women in, you know, professions like orthopedics to, to really have a good, you know, good spousal support to split the home duties as much as you can, right? Because it's, it's gotta be really hard to balance, balance everything. And I, I'm lucky, you know, my wife, she, she, she does have a career, but she's always been more about the home. So it's, it's allowed me to kind of focus a little bit more on work. Um, but at the same time, if, you know, if both partners are equally committed to work, you, they also should be equally committed to, to home stuff. Would you agree with that? I think that's totally true. And, um, there have been some really interesting articles in today's like new environment about pater the question of paternity leave. And that's something I'm obviously facing where my husband has to take one week of vacation as his paternity leave, because that's, he was basic that wasn't an option for him at this point. Um, and I think it highlights a bigger issue that if you are two working professionals, establishing kind of how are you going to set up your home and division of labor early on. And I think having paternity leave uh, is really helpful, especially if someone's a resident, because early on they learn, well, you can't tell me you don't know how to change a diaper or warm the milk uh -huh. or do yeah. those little things because you took paternity leave. Like you You'd be surprised. I <laughs> <laughs> So I think the idea of paternity leave is not so much like you, you can shape it in a lot of different ways. I think it's important for the dads to get to bond with their babies just as much as it is for a mother and the child. Um, but I think even more so if um, someone is trying to get, if the mother is trying to get back to work, I think 
paternity leave becomes extremely important in establishing kind of how you're going to face this new stress in your life as, as a team. How do you, uh, how do you bring in help? Like, like you say, if, if you're not going to stay at home and you're going to do that, do you, is, is help necessary? Is it mandatory? Like daycare, nannies, that kind of stuff. Have you talked about that? We have, we haven't come up with an answer yet. I think, um, I really like the idea of at least having our future child exposed to other kids uh, uh -huh. for socialization. Um, I think that's really important that they get to be around other kids rather than alone. But at the same time, the battle is like, oh, the, a lot of daycares have viruses floating around all the time. Your kid's more prone to get sick. If they're sick, they can't go. And then what? So yeah. they're... Yeah. Uh, a lot of unknown challenges ahead. Yeah. Um, what do you think about the, the culture, maybe not around you, but just in general regarding pregnancy and breastfeeding after, you know, in, in medicine and in orthopedics? Because I know like, like, for example, I, I know someone who is breastfeeding their child right now and, you know, they'll, they'll leave in clinic for 30, 45 minutes to go pump. And, it's been good. I mean, it's, you know, it's been like that pretty much all year. Um, right. And it, you can't, you're not, obviously no one's going to say anything. You can't say anything. Um, right. But behind, you know, uh, behind her back, I've heard things said, you know, yeah. like, uh, and how, what, what do you think about the whole culture? Are we, I mean, obviously we're not perfect. We're not there yet. Uh, but I do think it's getting better. Uh, I think it's becoming more normalized now um, as far as like lactation rooms and things like that. I don't know. What do you think? I, I think the lactation room certainly helps. I've also seen attendings and co-residents like ask if a clinic room isn't being used to use that space. Mm -hmm. If the lactation room isn't available, uh, which I think is really sad that the spaces aren't more uh, normalized at this point. But I do think it goes back to what you're saying, which is social norms. Why is it that as healthcare professionals we're kind of <laughs> denied this very natural process to right. like, populate the yeah. earth and want to yeah. do it in a certain way that we feel fit, especially when there are plenty of male or female attendings who are doing research calls during the day or consult consulting calls and which are e equally disturb like disruptive yeah, to the it kills the flow. Um and that's ultimately what people I can assume are getting frustrated by is like, oh it's slowing down clinic, we could yeah. be done this much faster um if we didn't have this and i don't know how you balance that and make feel and make people feel okay about it maybe you can't and you just kind of have to kill people with kindness and be grateful and tell them thank you i'm you know yeah it's kind of what i'm going through right now it's hard for me i understand this is frustrating for you but i'm really appreciative of your help yeah she but, uses, yeah, uh, she uses an old she uses an old office i think for her lactation room. Um, yeah. There's not really, you know, a nursing room there. But I know a lot of places are dedicating. I don't know if it's legal or not, but I know a lot of places are, are uh, trying to get, you know, at least set up a safe space for someone to go do that if they, if they need to. Right. Yeah, it's tough. I don't, I don't have the answers for these very, very challenging situations. <laughs> yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't look forward to them either, but... I'm just trying to remind myself, like, you know, I'm not trying to screw over anyone. I'm just trying to yeah. kind of realize other goals that I have as much as I love right. being a doctor and doing orthopedics. It also was really important to me to have a family. So, well, yeah, it's, I mean, it, it, it's, it'll probably be a good test for you, too. Right. Because, I mean, you'll you'll be pressured to put other things above that. Right. right? And you're, you're going to have to remind yourself. I mean, obviously, I, I've never been through this, but you'll have to remind yourself like why you're doing it. And uh, <laughs> like, I guess stand your ground. I guess. Yeah. You'll, you'll be pressured to do it yep. or get away from it. Um, and and I think it's it hard because I don't think uh, the male voice is recognized enough in these types of conversations as well. Like I've heard from a lot, of, not all, but there are plenty of male residents who do have young ch children and families and newborns at home who also, when, you know, they get asked to do that add-on case, 
your first instinct is to look at the clock and say, well, I haven't seen my kids in like four days. I really want to go home. Yeah. But yeah. you're the guy, right? Like, are right. you allowed to have that opinion? Can you, but I think it's an equally hard situation for a lot of male residents who have families and want to get home too, but feel yeah because of social norms they're not allowed to have that opinion well i think i think for a lot of good dudes male or female the work kind of becomes a safe haven for them too like i I know a lot of good dudes i will never say it but you know that they don't want to go home and (laughs) i i don't remember a very wise co-resident that loves Talos is <laughs> one time would spend an entire week on buddy call with me. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I don't know who that is. <laughs> we, we used to just tag team call. <laughs> well, we had important basketball games to get to. So. <laughs> <I remember. laughs> but um, I, yeah, some attendings will, uh, they'll just stay until five or six and they won't be doing anything. And it's awkward for you because you can't leave or you don't want to leave them. Right. Um, but they'll, they'll stretch out their like 10 patient clinic from eight to six and just to, just to avoid going home. But at least that's what I think. <laughs> that, that, that's yeah. That's crazy. Like I, I just wanted, I just want to get the work done and go home. Like right there. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. We're like go to a basketball game. Yeah. It's but, good um, yeah. I think there's, there's a really interesting point too. You were talking about how, how you know men also need to be you know i guess feel like they should have time for their families because in the in the end there's a certain amount of work in each family unit so if the if men are not able to go home and provide and help with that then it always falls on on the female on the woman to do and yeah. that's uh, that's just more burden and then i guess that ties into paternity paternity leave as well in a way um, I'll i'll share my experience with that like <clears throat> I had my first kid when I was a medical student and I was doing a MPH year, a master of public health year. And um, no offense to MPH people out there, but um, compared to medical school, my one year MPH degree was uh, pretty much a breeze. And I was in class two days a week and I got all my work done in another day. So I literally had four or five days off. Um, and so I had my first kid and I was around all the time. And I could I could help a lot, and it definitely helped with the with the bonding, and it was it was great. I felt you know there was immediate bonding, and I felt so much uh, so much love for my 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 daughter at first, and it was just very immediate. <clears throat> and then unfortunately, you know, for my second kid, I was in residency. You know, I only took a week off, and I was on spine service, and I remember we we get done at eight or nine p.m. And I'd have to round, um, I actually post up checks on my patients. I wouldn't get done until 10 PM sometimes. And then my kid's asleep. My wife's asleep. Uh, Mo, my boy there is in the ER doing consults. And so I'm like, well, if I go home, everyone's asleep. And like, I just want to hang out with my boy right now. So that's why, that's why we buddy <laughs> together for about you know a few days or a week. Like literally because of the structure, I, I wasn't able to, to be with my uh, my newborn kid and my whole all my family was asleep i was gonna have to sleep in an hour or two i i couldn't get anything done so i might as well see my boy but as a result like i i will say for sure that there was a uh, a hit to the bonnie experience with my second kid and Mo knows <laughs> it. All, all my all my good friends all my good friends know this and maybe it's maybe it's because he's a boy and i feel like uh I can be a little meaner to him. I don't know why, but for whatever reason, I, I, I made fun of him a lot as a, as a baby. And this is not, not anything that it's like, it's good or anything like that. But at the same time, I think it has to do with the fact that, yeah, I didn't get, you know, several weeks or even longer. I had a whole year with my, or I guess I had half a year with my daughter before I went to residency, uh, literally staying at home all the time. And, um, I think it definitely does do damage. And yeah, thankfully we're all good now. Me and my boy are like best friends now. And um, he beats me up more than I beat him up. Uh, but it's, you know, it definitely, there was some, it definitely took a hit in the beginning uh, when he was like a newborn baby. So I, I, I wish there was something that we could do to change the culture a little bit to where we're, we don't, we actually get protected time to, to help out at home and learn how to be a parent and to bond with their kids. 
And I think that helps yeah. the entire family. Like I think that's crucial to do. Um, I don't know how to how to do it, how to enact that change, but I think that's something that we should be more aware of. And I haven't heard a lot of people talk about that, so um, I'm glad we were able to discuss that a little bit. I think the uh, to change it, I think you just have to normalize it. Like if, if you think about the whole think about orthopedics as a whole. First of all, the whole concept of women in orthopedics is just growing, right? I mean, right. Yeah. Probably been maybe a decade or so. And then, so we're still conquering that hurdle. And then you have to conquer the whole pregnancy and ortho thing. And we got a ways to go. But don't, I mean, the more people that go through it and, you know, kind of stand up for it and go through the more normal it gets. And I, I think we'll get there. It's just going to take time. I don't, I don't know how you balance that with the paternal side of things. Because it's, it's definitely a double standard, I think. And I mean, that doesn't mean it's a bad thing, but there's there's two standards held. And uh, that's that's why you had to take vacation time for your time off. Yeah. But um, right or wrong, I mean, you know, you don't have to breastfeed. You don't have to. Right. I, guess, I mean, I guess that's what it is. But um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> you could if you wanted to. <laughs> the culture, you know. My wife, actually, she talked to me. She was like, you should take a few, you should take more than a week off. You should take two or three weeks off. Um, and I was like, well, no one else has done that. You know, I don't want to be, I don't want to be the resident who has a kid and takes like a month off, you know, several weeks off. And then everyone's like, oh, what are you like breastfeeding now? You know, like nobody wants to be the guy who's, who's doing that. But I think the, um, the repercussions of it are not easily understood to most people. It's more than just uh, healing your body and breastfeeding, as important as that is, but it's also learning how to be a dad and, and uh, to bond with your family a bit, so. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's tough. I, I watched, I mean, I wasn't born during this, but I was a small child when my mom went through residency. Um, so we had, we had some good help. My dad helped out. Uh, I, think, I think they hired a nanny to basically help. I was like, you know, three to six years old, somewhere around there. Um, but she had my brother when she was in residency. Uh, but that was at the very end, I think, right before she got a real job. Uh, so it was probably a little easier on her. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think it's getting better. It's just, it's going to take time. And more people I agree. are going to have to go through it. Yeah. It'll definitely take time. Uh, I think people are way more, are really supportive of it now. Um and at least I haven't heard of any issues like brought up to me. I think I'm sure internally I'm compensating and trying to work extra hard uh, leading up to it to make sure there aren't any issues and come back strong as well, uh, which certainly brings on a bit of pressure and anxiety around the whole thing. But yeah, the, the, there's definitely pressure there, right? Because you don't want to you don't want to set a bad tone for people after, after you, right? Exactly. Yeah, they don't want to have, like, when they think of someone taking time off for pregnancy, they don't want to have to think about all the extra work they're going to have to do. And that's really what it comes down exactly. to. Like, people don't want to have to do extra work. They don't want to want to have to inconvenience themselves for other people. And that's, isn't that the root of, like, all of our problems? <laughs> Not just pregnancy, but that's the root of everything. <laughs> right, right. So, yeah. All right, so you're going to have to come back and let us know how it goes after, <laughs> after this is all done. Sounds good. Yeah. So, all right. It's been an hour. Any, uh, any parting words, any parting wisdom? Uh, for those listening who are considering orthopedics, I think it's the best field out there. I think we have the most fun and uh, from residency to fellowship to the attending life. I don't, there's no like training to become something. It's fun all the way along. The ride is really fun uh, all the way through. So it's a great field. I, I've really loved it. Yeah. And it's great that you realize that now because I, it took me a while to realize that. It, it took me like, <laughs> Oh, there, there are definitely some hard days in there, but uh, you know, it's part of training and the experience and sometimes the struggles, what makes you better too. There you go. Strong wise words. Those are wise. That is wise. Wise words. Wise. All right. We're going to get you a good dude shirt. <laughs> good dude board. Yeah, the good, good dude shirts are going to happen. we got to make it. drop. Nobody steal our idea. We've already trademarked it. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, th well thanks for Joe, coming thank on. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Seriously, yeah, though, you got to come great. back and let us know how it goes. 
That was great. We'll do. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Bye. All right, Bye.